Why do some civilizations vanish at their height? This is a puzzle that has baffled archaeologists for years. Lost cultures disappear without trace, leaving nothing more than a myth or mysterious clue. They become riddles that capture the imagination. Atlantis left nothing but a baffling legend thousands of years old, a story full of tantalizing clues to the location of a lost city that sunk beneath the sea. But there were no gripping old stories about the miles of mysterious shapes drawn on a parched desert in southern Peru. So who had made them? Mysteries like these drive curious scientists and passionate individuals to seek solutions to key questions. What does it mean and where did it come from? But how do you solve the riddle of lost cultures that leave no written records? Unlike Atlantis, the mysterious Peruvian lines had lain unnoticed by European scholars for centuries. But at least they offered something more concrete to investigate than mere legend. Early aircraft flying across the coastal desert of Peru first raised interest in the lines. The first aviators in that region were astonished by what they saw. Beneath them, on an empty wasteland, there were what appeared to be runways. Flying lower, thousands of complex shapes could be seen on the uninhabited plains. The nearest town to the drawings was the Peruvian town of Nazca, 300 miles south of the capital, Lima. The shapes became known simply as the Nazca Lines. People were fascinated and began to want answers. What were these lines? How did they come to be on an uninhabited desert? Who had drawn them there? And what had happened to these people? David Johnson is a former high school teacher turned explorer who has spent years investigating the drawings. The lines in Nazca that most people are aware of are the ones you see from the plane, which are huge and large and do stand out on the ground and in the air. But there are hundreds of thousands of more lines in Nazca. Long lines make up the largest group of drawings. Some are even visible from space. But there are animals and plants too. One of the larger creatures is about twice as long as a football field. And this is a picture of an astronaut. That's what Swiss author Eric von Däniken announced when he examined Nazca during the 1960s and 70s. Von Däniken had another surprise. He declared that some of the lines were constructed with incredible precision to be used by the space travelers as landing strips for spaceships. These were the hundreds of blunt triangles that scientists call trapezoids. Von Däniken's ideas gripped the imagination of people around the world. For every shape on the ground, it seemed that there was an extraterrestrial explanation. The Swiss author's views appeared to receive unexpected backing when archaeologists uncovered these strange skulls near the Nazca drawings. With this evidence of what appeared to resemble beings from space, the popular view of the lines became inseparable from alien activity. But there is a deeper mystery here. Whoever made the lines would have spent long periods drawing the shapes. So how did they manage to survive in the driest desert on Earth? They would have needed abundant water. David Johnson now has a startling new theory that may show how they located it. This place was as dry a thousand and two thousand years ago as it is today. Those people who lived here had to understand where there was water sources or they could not have lived here year round. To verify his theory, David has enlisted the help of Professor Stephen Maybe, an expert in water geology from the University of Massachusetts. Right here where we are, they rarely see rain. The local people here have not really observed much rainfall in this area uh, over the last 50 years or so. There's really no rainfall here and there's no way to get water to this place. Together, they have ventured deep into the desert in a search for evidence to confirm David's theory. 
it is an area which still needs to be explored. And it seems so incredible. You can go to some place on Earth that really hasn't been mapped and where very few roads exist. Yet this wasteland holds an amazing surprise. The builders of the lines knew how to grow crops here, growing enough surplus food to spend time drawing lines. How could they have mastered this challenge? And what could have made such a skilled culture disappear? Dr. Marcus Reindel is a member of the Germany-based Institute for General and Comparative Archaeology. He and his team have spent years mapping and studying the lines in great detail. This has meant digging out and piecing together a jigsaw of evidence. We have to sift it to get out all the small fragments of ceramics. But in the laboratory, we can put these parts together in a very painstaking work and get nearly the, the whole ceramics. Marcus Reindel discovered elaborate fabrics together with the pottery. Both are decorated with animals and shapes that echo those drawn on the ground. He knows that the people who made the pottery must have built the lines, but identifying when presented an almost insurmountable obstacle. The age of the lines was impossible to estimate because marks on this parched surface take centuries to fade. These are the few raindrops that fell briefly four years ago, still imprinted on dusty rocks. But Marcus Reindel used the elaborate science of carbon dating on the remains of food and cloth from his excavations. A timetable has emerged from this careful analysis. The line building began around 400 BC. The origins of the Nazca lines are in drawings on the rocks of the valleys. And the same figures occur as the first uh, ground drawings always on the slopes of the mountains and they were very small about 10 15 20 meters and very figurative these were people creatures and spirals the Nazcans laid out larger and more abstract patterns when drawing moved on to the flat plains we can see also a development from figures to lines to cleared areas like the trapezoids. They were changing over the whole time they made the lines. Marcus Reindel found that the ancient Nazgans experimented with designs until they mysteriously stopped sometime before 600 AD. Over an entire millennium they had been made by small groups of people over successive generations. But how were these shapes actually drawn? Okay, what we've got here is a very coarse, sandy, gravelly surface, which is sometimes referred to as a desert pavement. When the Nazca built the lines, what they did was they moved this darker surface material aside, revealing the lighter soil underneath and created a tremendous contrast. Once, the cleared shapes were so bright they could not be missed a brand new trapezoid would have stood out brilliantly. Today, they have faded so much that they are hard to see properly. David stumbled across unfinished trapezoids out in the desert. Their construction materials were there. Bundles of stakes they had carried in where they had dumped baskets of uh, rock material, little small boulders and cobbles. And here, the shapes were staked out, ready to be constructed. David had spotted a series of poles that the Nazcans had been lining up to lay out the sides of trapezoids. And Marcus Reindel has bad news for those who still believe they are uncannily precise landing strips for flying saucers. Our mapping showed that not even this is true, that the lines are always so accurate and so straight. They are, in many cases, they are curved. With von Daniken's claims of spacemen completely undermined, Marcus Reindel's careful archaeology continues to demolish the alien connection. Some of the longer lines visible from space 
are now thought to be long distant paths. Marcus Rindell discovered that these sophisticated Nazcans traded with people over a thousand miles away, but his search is a race against time. Each square mile of some archaeological sites contain ancient art estimated to be worth millions of dollars in foreign sales rooms. The known sites add up to a multi-million dollar attraction for Tomb Raiders, who are rapidly destroying the secrets of the Nazcans. They ransacked Marcus's site before he got to it. It's obvious that they found um, great treasures, gold and lots of ceramics and other uh, things. They can sell on the art market and they are not interested in broken things. But the looters left something priceless behind. The ancient Nazgans themselves. So dry is the land here that they remain as mummies. Their incredible state of preservation reveals details of their life in the desert. This is the skull of someone who had enough spare time to take care of these awesome dreadlocks. This is the skull of an enemy, carried around as a trophy, its lips sealed with cactus thorns. And these eerie remains were the key evidence that helped underpin the theory of an alien connection. But Marcus Rindell now knows exactly what they are. Careful analysis of grave contents reveal they had actually been shaped by being tightly bound with cloth, beginning during infancy when the skull is still very soft. They are the skulls of the very earliest Nazgans. But another incredible surprise has emerged from the archaeologists' work. These were a sophisticated people who lived deep in a desert, yet had grown enough surplus food to support a complex community of skilled potters, weavers, warriors, and line builders. To do this, they must have had abundant, reliable sources of water. And David Johnson believes he knows the connection between these and the lines. He stumbled across the answer by accident in one blinding flash of inspiration. You sit down, you look around, you say, my God, I, I think I've got something here. Here we go. Should we check the oil? Yeah. David Johnson is heading into the desert to search for evidence that will support his theory for why the mysterious Nazca lines were drawn. He is taking geology professor Stephen Maybe to help verify the solution because he is an expert on how water moves through the earth. And these strange markings were left by a culture who knew how to grow abundant food in a part desert. It is absolutely sterile. Rolling hills, sand gravel covering it, once in a while bedrock showing up. Without any vegetation, there's no insects, no birds. The desert is literally a sterile desert. Yet the people of Nazca sit in an island of green watered by mysterious aqueducts that emerge from the sides of their valley. So important are these that each year the Nazcans risk their lives to clean the aqueducts and make sure they continue flowing. This can be lethal work. The earth they move through is regularly shaken and split by huge earthquakes. These pictures were shot in the immediate aftermath of a quake that demolished 80% of Nazca. It is only a matter of time until the earth moves again, shattering the land and opening up faults in the rock. These faults and the mysterious aqueducts are linked by David Johnson's new theory, but the connection was not obvious when he first came to Nazca. He had come for the day, but local people discovered he could locate wells by hunting for water with a pair of metal dowsing rods. In 1995, I came to Nazca as a tourist with my wife. And I ended up staying a week. And during that week, I actually spotted a well for the community in an area where everybody said there was no water. The rods I use are made out of just an L-shaped uh, piece of wire. They can be copper, uh, iron, steel, bronze, brass, anything but aluminum. I use just plastic BIC uh, pen uh, containers to keep them independent of my hand so they swing freely. So I'm not touching them. 
and then when I hold them like this, perpendicular and parallel to one another, they'll point to where the source of water is. In this case, we know we have one next to us, and as I move forward, as I encounter that source of water, the rods will point and show the direction of the boundary of the water source. Once I cross the water, they cross. And in this case, they're indicating a moderate rate of flow. If they cross completely, it's a very strong rate of flow. If they barely cross, it's indicating hardly any water. Now, as we come to the edge of this concentrated flow, they show the boundary again and therefore I can get the direction of flow and as I come off they stop crossing. It was during a search for wells that David stumbled on the surprise that was to change his life. He had been following a buried aqueduct with his dousing rods. And as I came up over a hill looking at a fault in front of me, here was this system pointing the course of what I was following. And at that point, uh, you just hyperventilate. You sit down, you look around, you say, my God, I, I think I've got something here. In one blinding revelation, David had spotted a connection between the underground water, earthquake fractures, and the Nazca lines. It had dawned on him that the ancient people must have drawn their ships to point to geological faults that carried water. Excited, David reversed the order of his hunt he now began following lines to see if they led to water. They did. David spent months on foot following lines across the desert to gain the evidence needed to convince others. Then he showed it to Steve Maybe. I was hooked, without question. And I said, this is a worthwhile idea that should be tested. But Steve is skeptical about dousing and wants to verify the theory scientifically. He wants to make sure that when lines, water, and the sites of ancient Nazcan communities come together, the result is statistically significant. I prefer to use the science and have the data drive the story rather than someone walking around with some rods. They have driven to a place far out into the desert in the hottest, driest part of the year. Yet, there is lots of water coming from somewhere. They spot it flowing from a spring in the side of the valley. And from the top of a rocky peninsula, the outlines of an ancient Nazcan community can be seen. The Nazcans must have used the spring 2,000 years ago. But where is the water coming from? The rainfall is so low, there's no way that we can get that amount of water on this peninsula from rainfall, unless there's another source of yeah. water. Steve knows what that must be. An hour's drive from Nazca, the Andes mountains rise to over 10,000 feet. Steve's analysis has shown how the water descends from here along the faults created by earthquake action. Some of it can percolate in through the soil and migrate through an interconnected network of joints, fractures, and faults. But reliable springs in a trackless desert were not enough for the ancient people, so they improved them. Over one and a half thousand years ago, the Nazcans built the mysterious aqueducts at the same time that they drew the huge trapezoids. On the valley side, Steve has spotted more evidence. Oh man, this is beautiful. <laughs> you can see at least three faults in there. There's a, yep. one large one there where you've got the buff colored, tan colored yep. sandstone and then the red. Across the valley, another large abandoned Nazcan site that used the subterranean water. But the Tomb Raiders have been here first. There's broken pieces of pottery, uh, textile fabrics all around us here. And this is just one tomb in a very large site. They have found a fault and an ancient settlement, but they need to find a trapezoid nearby. All three are needed for assessing as evidence for David's theory. Well, going and right as they here. climb out of the valley, yeah, they spot it, faded and most visible from above. Right. Once it would have been a dazzling pointer to water, 
David's theory appears to fit this place. Armed with evidence from this and many other locations, Stephen maybe has carried out a rigorous computer analysis. Some lines did match up to faults and springs, but Steve and David are going to have to come back to Nazca to get more detail. I think it's a very complicated book that we're trying to decipher here. And I don't know if there's just one straight answer that's going to explain it all. Their new study may finally reveal if the ancient Nazcans pointed to water with their mysterious shapes. I think, honestly, what will happen is we will find that many of these faults and water sources do line up with trapezoids, pointers. David Johnson remains certain that his explanation is a window on ancient skills. How sophisticated were these people? They didn't have computers. They didn't have trucks and planes. But they were able to develop an incredible understanding of their environment. But there is a final mystery that has drawn people to Nazca. What could have made the ancient culture disappear if they knew how to live comfortably in a harsh desert? The answer may lie in a link between the trapezoids and space. Professor Mike Bailey knows there was an immense global catastrophe just before the Nazca line stopped being drawn. It's the only event in the last two millennia that stands out in all the records. Well, Professor Mike mm -hmm. Bailey like, um, is the head of one of the world's leading tree ring analysis laboratories at Queen's University, Belfast. A cut through a tree reveals the rings laid down by each growing season. Ancient timbers can be read to see if the climate was good or bad when the tree was growing. Mike Bailey's records include the years when the Nazcans stopped drawing lines. This was a catastrophic seven-year period for world climate. We're not just talking about trees sort of not liking their growth conditions. We're talking about physical damage of some kind. But uh, the more you get into this event, the more it becomes clear that this is a very peculiar event. It is absolutely global in the sense that it shows up right round the, the planet, South, South America, North America, Siberia, Europe. Um, th this is a very significant environmental event. This is the kind of effect produced by dust from a super volcano. But no evidence for this has been found. Mike Bailey believes that this points to another cause. What's the next most likely cause of a global environmental event? And the answer to that is it would have to be something to do with a cometary bombardment, uh, something hitting the atmosphere, um, material being dumped into the atmosphere from space. This disaster from space may be the true extraterrestrial connection with the lines of Nazca. When their crops fail year after year, the ancient people would have despaired, despite their desert expertise. Lines pointing to water would have been of little use. So in the end, the masters of the desert would have abandoned their settlements or died, leaving their desert drawings to mark their existence and to enthrall explorers. The lines of Nazca first became famous less than a century ago, but another vanished culture left no mark only a puzzling tale that people have tried to decode for thousands of years. This is the legend of a sophisticated civilization called Atlantis that suddenly sank beneath the sea without a trace. The tale has driven individuals to spend years hunting for its true location. This Athens Theatre Company is preparing a performance of a simplified adaptation of the strange beginning of the myth of Atlantis. It can be traced back to just one man, Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher. In 360 BC, during one of his dry dialogues on political theory, he inexplicably changed focus. These dialogues have been studied by archaeologist Dr. Colin MacDonald. And suddenly, in the middle of all this, crops up this story of Atlantis. And it is related in great detail as though he had a precise source for this information. 
Many have dismissed the story as a literary device to explain politics, but Plato began to write an account of how a relative called Critias had been asked to tell the tale to Socrates. Critias, tell us about this famous ancient story declared to be not a mere legend, but an actual fact. It is a tale brought from Egypt long ago, Socrates. Plato wrote that the story had first arrived in Greece two centuries earlier, around 560 BC. A traveler had heard it from Egyptian priests, and the Egyptians claimed that this story was even older than their civilization. Their histories say of a wealthy, powerful island in the great ocean. 9,000 years ago, it disappeared. After violent earthquakes and floods, it vanished into the sea in a single day and night. Ever since the Egyptian tale emerged in classical Greece, people have been hypnotized by the legend. Where was Atlantis? What was the catastrophe that made it vanish? How did the story get to Egypt? To answer these questions, we must abandon modern assumptions because the geography of the ancient Greeks was very different to our own and place names in Plato's story had already been changed from their ancient Egyptian counterparts. Tell us more. The island's first king was Atlas. So the ocean was named Atlantic and the island called Atlantis. What we now call the Atlantic was a great ocean surrounding the entire known world of the ancient Greeks, which was much smaller than the world we know today. Such ancient geography has allowed Atlantis to be sighted near almost every country in the world. An estimated 2,000 books have been written on the subject and few agree. Even the Antarctic has been claimed for the lost island. But now, new geological and archeological knowledge is pointing to a real, massive catastrophe and precise location. One that geologist and disaster expert Dale Dominey Howes has studied in detail. This would have been one of the biggest events that's taken place during the last 10,000 years. It would have totally changed everything. For over 2,000 years, most people have dismissed the story of Atlantis as a myth. But increasing scientific evidence is emerging of rare, gigantic events that disrupt entire cultures. Dale Dominey Howes has investigated both modern and historic disasters. The environment is not a continuously evolving slow thing, but is punctuated by hard-hitting, high-magnitude events that actually change the course of history, change the course of time, and actually cause enormous environmental changes. Dale thinks he knows the real catastrophe that might have triggered the tale of Atlantis. But Atlantis searcher Jim Allen believes he has already found the sunken civilization on the other side of the world. He is an expert in the analysis of aerial imagery and places Atlantis in a completely unexpected place identified by one detail in Plato's story. A huge irrigated rectangular plain provided every variety of herbs, fruits and nuts. Egyptian priests knew the exact measurements of this and every other part of the island. Jim Allen has spent years carefully analyzing maps and satellite photographs using the ancient Greek measurement called the stade. Well, in the beginning I became interested in reading about things like Stonehenge and the pyramids. So I started a mammoth study into the origins of the ancient measuring systems. Then I came across Plato's story of Atlantis in which he talks about a rectangular level plane which measured 3,000 by 2,000 Greek stades. So then I looked at the Greek stade and then I thought about where this place might be. Jim located that plane in a place that has not seen seawater in millions of years. Confounding tradition, he went there on an expedition without a boat, armed with his maps and measurements and a grand vision. 
Atlantis is the whole continent of South America, and the capital of Atlantis, the capital city, was on the Alta Plano, which is the rectangular, smooth, level plane that Plato talked about. The Bolivian Altiplano is two miles above sea level. Jim's on-site investigations found a solution for it not being at the bottom of the sea. If we take the island that sank as being a volcanic island on the Altiplano, that is very, very possible to sink in the space of a single day and night. What is a perfectly dry piece of ground one moment, when it started raining, very quickly becomes a giant inland sea. The whole thing just floods. That still leaves the problem of how the story got to Egypt. According to Jim, the Atlanteans used larger versions of the South American reed boats still used today. In the very early days, the people would have voyaged by giant reed ships, and they would have gone across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, up the Indian Ocean, and that way they could have arrived in the, what's now called the Persian Gulf and Mesopotamia. Jim has found no concrete archaeological evidence for his theory but continues to seek Atlantis in the Andes. What I'm looking for is the kernel of truth behind the legend to find out where the original site was of this fabulous civilization he's talking about. Will it ever be possible for more than a kernel of truth to be revealed? Can searchers reconcile the detail in Plato with modern scientific knowledge? Recent research now reveals that great global disasters capable of destroying a country actually did take place at the time when Atlantis is supposed to have disappeared. 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, a rapid thaw poured out immense floods that drowned the low-lying lands of the world. This was within a few centuries of the ancient disaster described by the Egyptian priests. Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer has been using genetic analysis to unravel the huge population movements caused by the flooding. His book brought a stream of Atlantis hunters telling him he had finally found the lost island. But where did they say it was? Plato's account gives a clue. The climate was such that two harvests were possible each year, and an abundance of animals, including elephants, roamed the island. These details point to a tropical location, one that Stephen Oppenheimer knows well. The place which has the highest concentration and the highest variety of flood myths is Southeast Asia, which was the place which suffered the most flooding. As they fled from the lands that have now become the bed of the South China Sea, the survivors could have carried tales of the disaster with them. Southeast Asia um, was continuously occupied uh, throughout the last ice age. So people were living there when the sea was rising. But how could this story have reached Egypt thousands of years ago? Stephen Oppenheimer knows a possible way. There's been east-west trade between Southeast Asia and the Mediterranean region uh, for a very long time. For just how long has been revealed by nothing more than a spice, a clove, uncovered in a place in Syria called Turka. They're only grown in two islands in the Moluccas, which is in the eastern part of Southeast Asia. So this suggests, if this is confirmed, that cloves were actually being traded all the way from the Moluccas to the Mediterranean 3,700 years ago. And perhaps with the spice came the flood myth with every step of the way and every passing century embellishing the tale until Plato finally wrote it down. But one element in Plato's story makes it more likely that the myth did not travel from either Asia or the Americas. In the legend, both Atlantis and Athens were destroyed. Athens lies right on the earthquake-prone Aegean Sea. Tremors are frequent among the islands of the Aegean Sea, south of Athens. Each year, the inhabitants of the island of Santorini remember relatives lost in the great earthquake of 1956. But the island is also an active volcano, one that Dale Domini House has come to study. The Aegean Sea is being torn apart by fault lines which run east-west and northeast-southwest. 
As a consequence, we get lots of earthquake activity in the Aegean Sea, and also volcanoes like Santorini can develop very easily. The stripes along the cliffs of Santorini record a million years of volcanic activity. For seekers of Atlantis, the 30-foot thick top layer and the huge hole that is now the bay are both highly significant. Archaeologists and geologists now know that they are both remnants of a single gigantic event that matches the scale of Plato's story. The only disaster known to archaeologists of the epic proportions as described in the Atlantis myth uh, was the eruption of the island of Santorini. This supervolcano triggered environmental changes that stunted the growth of trees for years afterwards. Professor Mike Bailey's tree rings can pinpoint the exact year it happened. Uh, when we went and looked at our trees, lo and behold, we discovered that there is a growth downturn, really severe growth downturn, uh, which starts in 1628 BC and runs on for several years. Mike Bailey sees this in ancient timber for many European countries you're beginning to see, again, another one of these pictures emerging of uh, something showing up widely. Any civilization that existed close enough to this massive eruption would be marked by the event. A hundred years ago, archaeologists first began to uncover an incredibly old civilization on the island of Crete. It lay just 70 miles south of Santorini, fatally close to the supervolcano. Archaeologist Colin MacDonald has spent his career uncovering the buried secrets of the palaces of prehistoric Crete. This site at Knossos is the most ancient site in the whole island. Uh, it has the earliest um, evidence of habitation, going back to about 7,000 BC. But it was only in the second millennium BC that they achieved civilized status, the first civilization in Europe, in fact. This was the seafaring Minoan civilization. It used Santorini as an important trading post, and an entire town is being excavated on the island. Archaeologists have uncovered uncanny parallels with Plato's Atlantis story. The main city was a noisy, busy place full of people, built in white, black, and red stone. The whole island of Santorini sits on layers of white, black, and red volcanic stone, once used for building, and hot springs still flow from the earth on one of Santorini's small islands. There were fountains of hot and cold water. Buildings were constructed about them to be used in winter as warm baths. The palace of Knossos had baths and central drainage 3,700 years ago and the island was a center for trade and commerce. Speedy, wind-powered Minoan ships traded with the entire eastern Mediterranean. This brought them into contact with the Egyptians, just as Plato's tale demanded. But did the Minoan civilization vanish like Atlantis in the legend? Geologists and archaeologists are beginning to piece together a picture of what happened in 1628 BC. Certainly, uh, Crete, shortly before the eruption, was hit by a large earthquake, which caused a great deal of destruction throughout the island. 70 miles north, earthquakes also shook Santorini. Could these have been the Atlantean quakes that Plato wrote of? The Minoans had endured earthquakes before, but they could not have guessed at the terrors that would follow. Dale Dominey Howes can read that story from the timetable laid down by Santorini's layers of volcanic ash. What we've got is the old Minoan land surface, the places where agriculture would have been taking place. But then we've got the junction, the point in time where the Minoan eruption started to take place. So here, the, so the old soil, and so on. But then we've got a thin layer of ash and small pieces of pumice. And this seems to suggest that maybe there was some precursory activity. This is believed to have triggered an evacuation of Santorini. 
But then at some point after that, the volcano goes bang. Within 96 hours, the shape of the entire island would change. The immense eruption would have been visible right around the eastern Mediterranean. The eruption column is blowing up into the sky, maybe 36, 38 kilometers above our heads. And the pumice and the ash is starting to rain down around us. Now, this part of the eruption probably lasted about one day in length. As a crumbling Santorini became submerged under a deepening layer of ash, the Minoans' view from Crete would have been inexplicable and terrifying. They would have been able to witness it uh, at a distance of some hundred kilometers, and they would have seen the vast column of ash and smoke going uh, up into the air. Even the Egyptians would have seen the giant plume. For the Minoans, worse was to follow. It gets much more explosive. There are big bangs, big explosions. Much more material is being blown out of the vent. And this material is starting to roll down the side of the volcano and across the land surface. So this would have incinerated and blown to pieces anything in its path. Finally, the walls of the volcano would have collapsed. Part of the side of the volcano are falling down into the vent and then being exploded out like missiles and projectiles which are flying through the air again, 100, 200 miles an hour. And then eventually the eruption comes to an end, and that's perhaps lasted about four days in length. Throughout that time, some Minoans would have been in near total darkness. Because of the high ash column, it would have blocked out the sun, so day would have seemed like night. Dale Dominey Howes knows that attempts to reach Santorini would have been initially thwarted by the volcano's after effects. After the eruption, there were great big thick beds of pumice floating around in the central Aegean Sea. And over time, that pumice floated southwards to the north coast of Crete. And in fact, we find the pumice on the shore and on beaches today. This was exactly how Plato had described the aftermath of Atlantis. It left nothing behind but the soul of mud. The Minoans who eventually reached Santorini would have found the island to be unrecognizable. The busy trading center, once known to many countries, was lost to them. As the ash settled, life must have become desperate for the Minoans. You actually only need a very light fall of ash to cause burning and destruction of crops. And indeed, what we think is that over a period of several years afterwards, the ash falls poisoned the soil, made it difficult to grow crops. Ash layers have been found as far away as Cyprus, Turkey, and the Lebanon. As Crete and its territories reeled under the impact of the eruption, Minoan power began to wane. There's evidence for a decline in the numbers uh, of the population uh, after the eruption. The period immediately before the eruption is really the acme of Minoan palatial civilization. After the eruption, however, we see evidence of a kind of um, political disintegration. Blood-curdling rituals sprang up among the once proud culture. Their world changed. The Minoans began doubting their gods and adopted bizarre religious practices. This appears to include ritual cannibalism, where um, four or five young people uh, were killed, uh, their bodies then butchered, and the meat sliced off the bones, uh, all within a religious context. 150 years after the eruption, all that remained was a memory. Over a thousand years later, Plato wrote down the tale of a once powerful people who had used new materials. Great walls covered in metal surrounded the city, including a metal unknown to us. They had once lived on an island encircled by water. 
It had a mountain in the center, surrounded with rings of water. But they had lost all their power after a disaster that mystified them. It vanished into the sea in a single day and night. The Minoans possessed the then new technology of writing, so why was there no written account? The earliest writing in my known Crete um, was actually discovered by me uh, some meters away from here. It's part of a so-called Linear A tablet. Now, this Linear A script was only used for record keeping. So even though we have written records, we still lack a history. It is a truly prehistoric civilization. But the eruption was a truly enormous event. Surely tales of it were passed down the generations. I've always found it extremely strange that there isn't an obvious reference to the eruption of Santorini in either mythology or in some of the early histories. It's almost impossible to believe that such a thing would not have uh, stayed in the minds of the Minoans and have been passed down orally through the centuries. I think this remains a great puzzle. And there's one more puzzle. Plato dated the destruction of Atlantis about 8,000 years earlier than the Santorini eruption. But Plato never finished his story. Why such an evil end for this paradise? He wrote of how Critias began to explain why the gods had destroyed the island. Zeus, most mighty of gods, destroyed it when he saw the Atlanteans lost all virtue. But here, Plato abruptly stopped writing as inexplicably as he had begun, leaving behind an incredible story that has fascinated people for centuries. The vanished civilizations of the Minoans and the Nazca may appear to be unique events in prehistory, but can we learn a lesson for the future from them? Dale Dominey Howes believes we should. When we look back into the historical, archaeological and geological records, what we discover is that time and again there are repeats and cycles of these events. So if we project forward to the future and think about what might be the impact of that event now, we have some serious problems to contend with and to cater for. Who knows where and when? the next great catastrophe will occur. Archaeologists continue to explore the mysterious cultures that lived beyond the edge of written history. Meanwhile, passionate individuals will continue to put forward new theories that reveal a possible location for Atlantis or the meaning of the lines at Nazca, a search that may never end.